Hello, everyone, and welcome to the UVA Medical Center Hour. I'm Justin Mutter, Director of the Medical Center Hour, which is a program of our UVA Center for Health, Humanities, and Ethics. We're delighted to offer today's event in partnership with the UVA Health Sciences Library Historical Collections. The Joan Echtenkamp Klein Memorial Lecture in the History of the Health Sciences emphasizes the critical relevance of historical inquiry for today's social and medical challenges. As is standard for the Medical Center Hour, continuing education credit is available for today's event, and we invite you to follow the directions on the slides that will appear again at the end of today's session in order to claim your credit. Today's event is in Zoom-only webinar format. Participants can enter questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen, which will be monitored by our moderator following the lecture as our discussion continues. It is my privilege to introduce to the Medical Center Hour stage our moderator for today's lecture, Professor Dominique Tobel. Professor Tobel is the Centennial Distinguished Professor of Nursing and the Director of the Eleanor Crowder Drawing Center for Nursing Historical Inquiry at the University of Virginia School of Nursing. Dr. Tobel has written extensively on the history of pharmaceuticals and medical informatics, among many other topics, and is completing a major new work in the history of nursing in America due out at the end of this calendar year. We are grateful to Professor Tobel for introducing today's distinguished speaker and guiding our conversation afterward. Dominique. Thank you, Justin. Um, it is with tremendous pleasure that I introduce today's speaker, Dr. Keith Weilu. Um, I had the privilege of first meeting Dr. Weilu when I was a graduate student many years ago, and I've just benefited enormously from his incredible scholarship ever, ever since I was a graduate student. Um, so Dr. Weilu is Henry Putnam University Professor of History and Public Affairs at Princeton University, where he teaches in the Department of History and the School of Public and International Affairs. He previously served as Vice Dean of the School of Public and International Affairs, and he currently serves as President of the American Association for the History of Medicine. Dr. Weilu is an award-winning historian of science, medicine, and health policy. He is the author of six books and the co-editor of five others. And among his books are Dying in the City of the Blues, Sickle Cell Anemia and the Politics of Race and Health, Pain, A Political History, and How Cancer Crossed the Color Line, all of which I can highly recommend in addition to his other, um, other books. Collectively, Dr. Weilu's research integrates history and health policy, um, touching on drugs and drug policy, on the politics of race and health, on the interplay of identity, ethnicity, gender, and medicine, and on controversies in genetics and society. In 2021, in recognition of his influential body of historical scholarship on race, science, and health equity, on the social implications of medical innovation and on the politics of disease, Dr. Weilu was awarded the very prestigious Dan David Prize. Uh, and this prize celebrates scholars whose work and research has made outstanding contributions to humanity. And also in 2021, Dr. Weilu was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Today, Dr. Weilu will be speaking to us about his most recent book, which was published in 2021 by the University of Chicago Press. Again, I highly recommend it. Um, the title of which is Push and Cool, Big Tobacco, Racial Marketing, and the Untold Story of the Menthol Cigarette. Dr. Weilu, over to you. Uh, Dominique, thank you so much for the invitation to give this year's Joan Acton Camp Klein Memorial Lecture and um, to give a short presentation as part of the Medical Center Hour. Um, as you mentioned, my work focuses on a wide range of topics in the history of medicine and health. And it, it's somewhat ironic that I decided a number of years ago to write a story about, uh, write a book about a product that has had incredibly adverse implications for health in America, that is the cigarette and particularly the menthol cigarette. The menthol cigarette is very much in the news these days. Two weeks ago, the Food and Drug Administration submitted to the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, uh, proposed rules on the menthol cigarette. And many anticipate that these rules that the agency has submitted with, is proposing a ban on all menthol cigarettes. OMB has a, a role whenever a, an executive branch agency is proposing a policy 
with significant economic implications to do an economic and fiscal analysis. The FDA has promised following OMB's rulings to issue a final rule on menthol cigarette smoking uh, in, by April 2022, so in a matter of a few months. Uh, when FDA submitted this rule, we don't know the details of the rule yet to OMB, um, one of the many reform groups, the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, issued a press release applauding this step. Um, noting that the FDA was standing up to the tobacco industry, proposing this bold life-saving policy that will protect kids from tobacco addiction, advance health equity, and save lives, especially among Black Americans. And the press release also cited cigarettes as, menthol cigarettes in particular, but cigarettes in general, as a major cause of health disparities. The debate about the menthol cigarette, whether it should be banned or not, has been at the focal point of public policy debate for many decades, but particularly it became heated in 2009 after Congress passed and President Obama signed legislation that gave FDA unprecedented new powers over the regulation of tobacco. It's kind of Fascinating to reflect on the fact that for a hundred years and more, tobacco was not deemed to be a drug and as a result did not fall under FDA authority. That changed dramatically in 2009. The 2009 legislation also banned all flavored cigarettes as illegitimate enticements, particularly for youth initiation of smoking. But Perhaps surprisingly, but I'll explain exactly why, menthol as a flavored cigarette type was exempted from that 2009 legislation. So for the last 20 years or so, and arguably predating 2009, 2000s, um, the arguments in favor of the banning menthol came from community activists, public health advocates, and epidemiologists who argue that since the 1960s, menthol brands have been marketed deceptively as refreshing and cool. And from the 60s onward, this market grew. It grew to the point where over 70%, arguably 80% of African-American smokers, that is people who smoke, prefer menthol brands as opposed to 30% of white smokers. So there's a disproportionate preference among black smokers for menthol brands. Uh, and the argument for its banning hinges on the argument that the tobacco industry successfully positioned menthols among youth hip smokers with an appeal that was associated with health and that this has had long-term detrimental health impacts. There's a scientific argument that underpins this that argues that menthol smoking uh, produces deeper inhalation, a sort of sensation of anesthetic coolness, uh, a soothing idea uh, that, uh, that makes smoking easier, uh, produces higher rates of disease, lower rates of quitting, and also like other banned flavored cigarettes is an illegitimate enticement, a starter product for young. The industry has argued against banning menthols um, on a wide range of bases. One of the arguments that's made is that the majority of all menthol smokers are white, regardless of the higher percentage of African-American smokers who prefer menthols. They argue that it is a legitimate racial preference and the vast majority of African American smokers prefer menthols. And they also argue that menthols do not make cigarettes any more dangerous than they already are. It's in this context of a riveting debate about this product that I began the book on the menthol cigarette in, a, in the next maybe 30 minutes or so, I'll try to describe to you the broad contours of this book. It's a history of a product that did not start with a promise um, of kind of, we did not start with racially targeted marketing. In fact, the menthol cigarette began with a different kind of promise, a promise of health. 
it was marketed in its early years for its apparent anesthetic value. We all know the experience of eating a mentholated product or using mentholated toothpaste, that distinctive feeling of coolness in the throat. Uh, so the menthol cigarette emerged as a, sm uh, as, as a device to remedy what was often called smoker's throat. We also know that the menthol sales skyrocketed in the 1950s, associated with a new era linking smoking to cancer and other health ailments. Um, and the rise of the menthol cigarette was not an accident. It was a rise that coincided with what industry studied as the cancer scares, in which the apparent therapeutic value of menthol was seen as um, a, a positive trait that industry could build on to relieve and assuage the anxieties of smokers. It's in the 1960s that the industry, Brown and Williamson, RGR, and others pivoted aggressively away from health pitches, um, which remained there but became implicit, to a much more aggressive strategy of racially focused advertising. And that strategy intensified in the 70s and 80s uh, as companies pushed into what one uh, called poverty markets in the 1980s and 1990s with new strategies, for instance, urban billboards in an era after cigarette ads on TV and radio was banned. And it's really since the 1990s that we've seen a rising critique uh, in public health, in communities, resisting these trends, the proliferation of billboards in urban communities. Uh, we've also seen menthol's unlikely supporters emerge in Black communities, not just within the industry. And what I'd like to do is to kind of describe this history in very quick, uh, in a quick overview to understand where the forces have emerged that have led cities and states and ultimately the federal government today to propose this ban. As I said, this is a long history uh, of how menthols became entangled with health claims. And as a story in medicine, it's, it's fascinating and also frustrating and disturbing to see the strategic ways in which the cigarette, this cigarette brand became popular with promises of temporary relief from throat irritation. And these were not implicit, but in fact, explicit in early cool and um, uh, cool advertisements. So cools, Here's a Chicago Tribune article from 1947, an, an advertisement in which it asks explicitly, do you have smoker's throat? Do you need a break from congestion and irritation if you do smoke cools? Or in 1952, the Willie the Penguin, who was the spokesperson for cools, says when April showers make you cough like crazy, refreshing cools taste fresh as a daisy switch from hots to cools as your steady smoke for that clean, cool taste. The, source the sources that allow me to tell the inside story of how this, these markets were built around tobacco products like Cool and Salem are the byproduct of uh, lawsuits that were brought by the Department of Justice and a state's attorneys generals across the country in the late 1990s that produced an archive, an archive that allows scholars like me or any of you sitting at your computer to search the internal documents of industry. And it's there that I found uh, the, the fact that markets were built not simply because um, products found consumers, but there were these crucial intermediaries. Uh, the book that I wrote ends up being a study of the research that's conducted in the industry by social psychologists, by focus groups, by pollsters, by surveyors, by market analysts and others who study consumer behavior and super, consumer psychology. They're companies like the Psychological Corporation or the Institute for Motivational Research or famous po pollsters like Lewis Harris that allow the industry to understand very intimately the perceptions, anxieties, and concerns, the health beliefs, 
In fact, the industry was doing identity-based studies long before identity politics became a, a central point of debate in American academy. They were doing race and gender studies long before black studies and gender studies became academic topics of investigation and teaching. They studied persuasion, they studied perception, and they studied exploitation. That's an actual term that's used in the marketing to think about how you seize opportunities that are being created to push products. So the book is based on an ability to look behind the curtain um, that emerged that, that I'm allowed to do because of the master settlement agreement between states attorneys general and the industry that produces this archive. And it's in this archive that I've been able to write the history of the consultants, what um, the journalist Vance Packard called the hidden persuaders, the economists, the sociologists, the psychologists like Ernest Dichter, uh, the founder of the Institute for um, Motivational Research. It's also here that I'm able to track the competition between companies uh, like Brown and Williamson, R.J. Reynolds, Laurel Art, and Philip Morris, which was never really able to create a successful menthol brand, but studied very, very carefully the work of other companies. It's here that I'm able to study the way in which markets were built and maintained, sometimes in the wake of advertising bans. So after television advertising is banned, it's here that you see a relentless focus on the rise of um, inner city markets with a new advertising push towards uh, urban billboards or point of purchase billboards. As I said, Big Tobacco in many ways is studying identity. They're doing black studies, they're doing gender studies and urban studies really long before these are academic areas of investigation. And it's in this doc, in the documentary base, this archive, that you're able to get an intimate sense of how markets are maintained. So for instance, when in the early 1950s, the first epidemiological studies come out that link tobacco to cancer and then ultimately to other forms of uh, cardiovascular and other ailments, the industry becomes intimately and concerned about what the implications would be for smokers in general. And it's in the 1950s that uh, companies like Market Planning Corporation begin to study how menthol's appeal intersects with health anxieties, with class concerns, and how menthol is emerging in popularity as a compromise product. They study how Salem as a cigarette, this is quoting from a study that's done by the Marketing Planning Corporation that's based on in extensive interviews with 750 people. They study how Salem as a cigarette is a little more of an upper income bracket cigarette. Cools on the contrary are seen very clearly as low income cigarettes. And that there's a feeling that cool is smoked by older and retired people. Cool has been on the market far longer since the 1930s. It also highlights that cool and Salem smokers are acutely conscious of their health. The personality tests show that the menthol smokers concern about their health is based on deeper lying aspects of their personalities and they're much more aware of health than the average person. They can neither, the menthol smoker can neither give up smoking easily nor smoke without feeling some sense of threat and they therefore seek a compromise. And they are smokers who are trying to evade the issues raised by cancer research. In some, the Salem smoker faces a dilemma. Salem is a new product emerging in the 1950s to compete with the older style product, Cool. He wants, the Salem smoker wants a great deal from his cigarette and he's not prepared to give up some qualities. So this is where you see the study of health psychology being tailored to the marketing of products. Now in the early 1960s, if you had said to most any tobacco industry expert that um, there was a racial appeal to menthol smoking, they would have looked at you quizzically because they knew that menthols were popular among those who were health anxious and also those who were younger. Um, Salem sales were rising rapidly on college campuses and studies like this from 1962, 1963, 
document in the intimate ways in which the industry is tracking behavior and preference. And actually the fact that uh, college newspapers were the most popular focal points for tobacco advertising and menthol advertising in the early 1960s. If you told people that race intersected with um, menthol preferences, they would have looked at you and laughed and said, of course, that's simply not true. In fact, there were studies that suggested that African-Americans in 1961 and 62 did not like menthols at all. Uh, so this is an era in the early 1960s in which advertisements to newspapers is uh, still booming. Uh, on college campuses, there were strategies of couponing, hiring students as sales representatives, and giving up free samples. It's with the increasing public and regulatory critique of youth-oriented marketing in the early 1960s the concern uh, about how tobacco was trying to arguably entrap youth into smoking because this would produce long-term users. Uh, it's in this context that the industry pulls back from, uh, threatened by regulations from college advertising and pivots aggressively to urban advertising using similar strategies of focus groups, psychographic studies, street corner interviews to understand a new kind of market, a market that's defined by social anxiety, health worries, gender concerns, and so on. So there are companies like Philip Morris that tries to find markets for men using its product Alpine and companies like Brown and Williamson that push aggressively into cities. This is the cover image from my book. This is a Bronzeville black section of Chicago, mid 1960s. Uh, and these are the kinds of images that come to dominate cool advertising through the 60s and into the 1970s. I wanna give you a, a sense of the intimate way in which the industry studies uh, community in, in an effort to influence behavior. Uh, there are thousands of studies like this. I'll just give you one example that comes from the creation of markets in Black St. Louis in November 1967, a particularly secretive predatory strain of racial capitalism announced by a marketer um, uh, that is trying to advise how camel, camel menthols can compete aggressively with cool. This is to summarize our thoughts on a way to reach the Negro market for camel menthol and specifically what we recommend doing in the Negro area of St. Louis. One of the things that the Dancer Fitzgerald sample report argues is one needs to understand generational tensions of the 1960s that Negroes don't want what daddy used to smoke or drink that's old fashioned and low class. One needs to, in creating markets, appeal to black pride and reject white black, black pride and the desire to reject white standards. The memo notes that the Negroes no longer look to the white market and its purchasing norms to set the pace in what to buy. Again, Negroes are becoming increasingly proud of the fact that they are Negroes, and they are now rejecting many of the standards or patterns set by the white community. And a document like this goes even deeper to explain how it is that one works with uh, African Americans in black in black St. Louis to create and influence behaviors. In both working in Negro and, and, and social situations, says the memo, Negroes tend to gravitate to groups, and Negro men usually spend more time with their respective groups than the average white man, whether it be in bars, club meetings on the street or at their job. Within these groups, there are centers of influence, individuals who lead the others because they are either more in the know or they are more forceful. These are not leaders in the sense of being president of the PTA or a local civic organization, but might well be a barber, a numbers man, a bellhop, a bartender, or a taxi driver. And the memo describes these as kingfish. They are the best way of spreading news. They have a strong desire for status and class, and it's to these individuals that we are um, suggesting the delivery of boast material, that is to say free samples to these uh, cell groups. We must impart prestige and factual knowledge in a personalized, almost secretive manner, in addition to the product itself, 
we must aim this pr pr promotional effort at the leaders and communicators within Negro cell groups. This is kind of early behavioral psychology, behavioral economics being kind of practiced at the level of neighborhoods uh, by um, a company that's attempting to create camel smoking markets. The initial information given to these selected individuals is called boast material in that it allows them to be in the know and brag to friends about the inside information on a particular brand. So what one finds in the archives is the strategies by which industry studies closely how race works at the local, local neighborhood level, how you inf in influence behavior. And they study phenomenon that is really quite revealing if they weren't um, you know, selling cigarettes and also quite shocking since they are. Uh, they're, they're interested in what, um, how race and even racism underpins buying behavior. They're alert uh, over time to shifts in sentiments such as negative views among white youth about black imagery. So in the 1960s, they studied the way in which white youth in an era of increasing attention to African-American culture, music, and fashion, how those trends are provoking white youth to emulate black imagery, black trends, black culture, uh, black clothing and music. But they're also aware in the 1970s to how resurgent racism in every region might have also implications for the kinds of choices uh, that users are turning to. And so for instance, in Chicago in a 1976 to 78 marketing plan, they explain that feelings of racism, this is another study that explains that feelings of racism, particularly anti-Black racism, are more widespread among Chicago white people than in the country generally. And anti-Black feelings are also expressed in their dislike for integrated ads. So it's in the aftermath of national radio and television advertising bans in 1971, which are intended to kind of short circuit the ability of the industry to reach not just mass audiences, but also youth audiences, that one sees another round of intensification of the urban focus wherein the industry begins to study the influence of outdoor advertising, uh, the use of public transit and other strategies. I won't go into details, but they study you know, commuting routes in it just as intimate a way as they studied you know, black social, social structure in St. Louis in 1967. They studied which buses African-Americans traveled. And if that bus traveled through white neighborhoods, they explained that you could advertise with black themed advertisements on the inside of the bus, but not on the outside of the bus. So from the 1960s to the 2000s, none of this would really have been possible without supporters. Without supporters often, even within black media. Uh, and one of the things I do in the book is to explain the way in which tobacco strategy depended on publishers uh, like John Johnson, the publisher of Ebony Magazine, black newspaper publishers around the country who looked to the industry for advertising revenue. Uh, John Johnston is well known for saying, well, at least in my book, he, he notes that, you know, in an atmosphere of segregation where African Americans feel locked out of certain kinds of opportunities um, for conspicuous consumption, he says that African Americans often strive for what he called compensatory gratification. In some cases, they overconsume, in others, they underconsume. And so marketers needed to understand the ways in which brand preferences was an alt alt alternate route for actually, for upward mobility, for conspicuous consumption and for navigating these concerns about social status. And it's in this context in the 1960s that we begin to see black themed advertisements in Ebony Magazine and others. Um, I also wanna highlight the way in which the industry understood and studied intimately what might be called inner city urban adversity as not just a, a source of social anxiety and concern, but as a profit nexus. Um, here's a kind of typical study of a focus group from 1985 
as part of what um, the makers of Cool called um, one, one, one social scientist group studying Cool's inner city racial uh, research project in which um, they argue that we have, to, we have to understand, to understand Cool's appeal is to understand the kind of the desire of African-Americans to move outside of the inner city, the ghetto, and how cool appealed to those who were looking to leave the ghetto mentally, even if they could not leave it physically. As this study notes, based, as I said, on focus groups of Black kids, these young adults may be realizing at an early age that there are limits to their ability to control their destinies. They're already acutely aware of the obstacle of the ghetto. Inadequate prenatal and early infant care, rough childhoods, early street life, the drug maze, and escape long-term involvement with the criminal justice system. They are survivors. And as survivors, they look for something hopeful and positive for a way out of the ghetto, if not economically or physically out of the ghetto mentally. And with no sense of irony, um, these social scientists working on behalf of the makers of Cool argue that this is what Cool represents to urban youth, an appeal to leave the ghetto, if not physically, uh, and then mentally. The book turns after looking at the kind of expansion of these strategies in Black um, cities across the black neighborhoods and cities across the country, it looks at the rise of local activism in the 1990s. Um, one of the favorite characters of mine from this book is somebody who was doing something undeniably illegal in Chicago in the late 1980s. He went by the name Mandrake. His name is Henry McNeil Brown. And here he is pictured doing what he did in the dead of night across Chicago in black neighborhoods in the late 1980s, which is blackwashing and whitewashing uh, alcohol and tobacco billboards. He called uh, tobacco a drug of illusion that was being created uh, by those who wanted to sell African-Americans on a kind of false message of hope. But he also symbolizes the rise of community activism against the proliferation of urban billboards in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, combined with the, the work of public health advocates who take aim at new strategies and new billboards. Uh, at this time also, ironically, the defenders of the billboard, the defenders of the industry also came from black communities. Um, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP and its executive director, uh, Benjamin Hooks became one of the key champions uh, for defending the right of these companies to advertise. Of course, the NAACP had grown to be itself dependent on tobacco financing uh, through the 1980s. They've recently changed their tune on tobacco and menthol in particular. A major turning point in these debates was 1990, in which um, a year in which R.J. Reynolds came out with a, a rather bold argument that, you know, rather than making implicit arguments about African Americans smoking menthol cigarettes, let's just come out with a product uptown that was going to be a blacks only menthol cigarette. Uh, they were going to test market it in Philadelphia, and one of the people ironically who critiqued this most aggressively was not Benjamin Hooks who defended the industry's right to do this, but the Secretary for Health uh, Human Services under the George Herbert Walker Bush Republican administration, Louis Sullivan. Now, Louis Sullivan was a physician, uh, the founding dean at Morehouse Medical College, and who immediately called out RGR strategy as slick and sinister and promoting a culture of cancer. I say this is ironic because this is from coming from a business friendly Republican administration, but Louis Sullivan really did not mince his words. He took aim at this industry. Uh, he compelled really Uptown to withdraw its plan. And through the 1980s, 1990s, you begin to see the tide shift against billboards, such that when the departments of, uh, Department of Justice and when uh, the state's attorneys general uh, take the industry to task uh, and compel them to settle 
for years of deceptive advertising and concealing the health, um, the health implications of smoking from the broader public. When the industry settles, one of the terms of that settlement is the outright banning of billboards. And one could point back to Henry McNeil Brown as really the kind of the beginning of that trend. It also, the, 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 modif the, the master settlement agreement of 1998 also opens up the conversation about whether menthols should be banned. I won't go into great detail. I just wanna conclude by the fact that, you know, my book really tracks how it is that the argument about menthol uh, grows and reaches a culmination uh, in 2020, well, 20, uh, 2009, when menthols are almost banned, but are exempted. Uh, when the FDA is given authority to decide on the question, and the 13 years of debate within the FDA about whether it would proceed. When I was writing the conclusion of my book in 2020, um, this kind of tragic convergence uh, occurred to me, which is why I end the book with a conclusion titled Deception by Design, The Long Road to I Can't Breathe. When George Floyd was murdered outside of Cup Foods, in Minneapolis, uh, the New York Times reported that he died outside a establishment that was known for selling the best menthol cigarettes in the city. At the time, COVID was disproportionately uh, claiming uh, the lives of African Americans and people of color and Latinos and Native Americans. And I was sitting down to write the conclusion to this book on menthols. And it occurred to me that there was some think tragic about this convergence in which African-Americans lives were being taken disproportionately by COVID, uh, decimating their lungs, often ending in the tragic uh, complaint, I can't breathe, uh, in which uh, disproportionate policing uh, practices was also harming African-Americans, making I can't breathe into a rallying cry. And during which, uh, what I realized is that the story of menthols was converged with this. The difference being, of course, that um, each of these tragedies that were afflicting African Americans occur over different timescales. Uh, policing uh, a death for George Floyd occurring in minutes, uh, COVID deaths occurring within uh, days and weeks, sometimes months, but the story of menthols and its disproportionate impact on African-American lives is a hidden story. It occurs over decades, uh, and sometimes the culprit isn't as clearly discernible. It's certainly uh, not a policeman with his, his knee on the neck of a smoker, but it is no less devastating in the long run. And so the story that I end up telling in this book, and I'll end here, is the story of the long and crooked path by which menthol and menthol's influence and exploitation has had this detrimental effect on smokers in general. It's, as I said, why I end the book with the long road to I Can't Breathe. It is the story of the role of these hidden persuaders, the health marketers, the social scientists in the making and remaking and the securing of menthol markets. Uh, it's a study of also the larger web that has helped to keep menthol in place and the way in which this product has been associated with the production of racial disparities, structured inequalities that are not separate from, but are certainly conjoined with the concerns about disproportionate impact of aggressive policing and COVID. And uh, so I will end there and look forward to uh, chatting with you about any and all of this. Thanks. Thank you, Keith, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, there's your, the, the presentation and then the book itself is so rich with detail. Uh, I have many questions and I'm sure our audience does too. Um, I think where I'd like to start is thinking about the, um, I think you, you, you refer to menthol as a deceptive chemical in the book and, and thinking about the ways the history of menthol both as chemical, but, but then how it becomes embedded within racial marketing that you describe. Um, what, how, what this suggests about that 
the porous boundary between how we define drugs and medicine and illicit and illicit um, drug use? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the one of the interesting things about the rise of mentholated smoking is that it was explicitly understood as a drug. It was promoted as a drug um, because of its distinctive sensation. Uh, menthol was understood to be an anesthetic, uh, and it was also understood to have moderate antibacterial properties by physicians in the early 20th century. And so the rise of the mentholated smoke was explicitly about the health giving uh, promise of menthol. Now, there was also debate about whether menthol was detrimental in the early 20th century, and physicians and scientists were asked to weigh in on the question. The interesting thing about the early history is how menthol migrated in both its classification and in terms of its regulation from being understood as a drug to being a mere flavor. And it turns out that when, if you classify a substance as a drug or a flavor, it matters enormously in terms of its regulation, in terms of you know, who has authority over it. Um, just like the, 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 the history of tobacco not being declared as a drug, allowing tobacco manufacturers to evade, um, evade regulation uh, from the FDA. So this question about, now what's also interesting is that from the early on, it was understood that menthol was what one scientist at Yale called a perversion of the senses. It, it, it's a trick of the senses in the sense that it gives a, a sensation of coolness, a sensation of one's airways being opened, when in fact, there's been no change in uh, bronchodilation, and there's no change in the temperature of one's throat. Uh, and so it was, it's this trick that allowed a kind of uh, a therapeutic argument about what menthol does to flourish and grow associated with many products, including menthol cigarettes. And I wanna sort of say one last thing, which is um, last year, the Nobel Prize was given to two scientists, one of whom studies menthol, the other studies pepper. Uh, they both do the same kind of thing, which is that they give the sensation of heat and coolness on the nose and the throat and the mouth without changing temperature. How does that happen? Well, it happens because of the way in which certain kinds of uh, parts of the brain are activated. And so the, the study of the, you might say there's a science of deception that has recently been awarded the Nobel Prize that helps us to understand how this product works and how this particular kind of deception works, not just on the mouth and the throat and the nose, but also in the brain. Thank you. And I'm, and I'm glad that you brought up the issue of regulation, because I wonder if you could say more about this kind of uh, the, the limits of government regulation in this long history of the menthol cigarette and um, what what yeah, what, what this reveals about the limits of regulation. Well, it also it, it what it tells us about the limits of regulation is that um, regulation of substances depends heavily on on how we how we define those substances. Uh, and in some ways, uh, tobacco has, tobacco products through real uh, power and influence more than anything else, rather than you know, outright scientific classification has, uh, has been allowed to skirt regulation. Uh, and, and even when the FDA before 2009 sought to assert the right to regulate uh, tobacco, this was actually asserted and then shot down by the Supreme Court that essentially said, you know, one cannot deem tobacco to be a drug unless it's been declared as a drug by an act of Congress. And so that is why the 2009 legislation was necessary. Now, the irony is that uh, the, the, the reason why uh, in 2009 menthol was exempted is because there were, there were 
members of the Congressional Black Caucus who accepted the argument offered by the industry, uh, often because they were funded by industry, that, that menthol should be understood not as an illegitimate flavor preference and an enticement, but as a, a legitimate Black preference and to ban it would be discriminatory. So a lot of these debates about how you classify a substance are not just, they don't just hinge on scientific classifications, but also on these political maneuvering and political classifications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was also interested in, you know, in the book where you, where you refer to regulators as unwitting influences, influences in the creation of these markets, because when regulation did come down on tobacco manufacturers more broadly, the, they responded by shifting their marketing strategies. That's right. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the sad historical observations that emerges from this book is that, that as it's a story of une uneven regulation. That is to say, when in the 1950s and early 1960s, there's an increasing anxiety uh, among public health officials um, in the context of the Surgeon General's report about advertising cigarettes to youth, the industry pulls out of certain kinds of marketing strategies, but they move aggressively into cities. And similarly, when uh, ads are banned on television and radio, they move even more aggressively into cities. So it's a sad story about the ways in which regulation in one realm can actually drive the industry to strategize even more um, uh, successfully, really, and shrewdly. Uh, the line between kind of shrewd marketing and predatory you know, marketing is a really um, a tricky one, but it's certainly one of the unintended consequences of increasing awareness of, uh, of the detrimental health implications of smoking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I have many more questions, but we have some questions coming in the Q&A, so I think I'll shift our focus to those for, for a few moments. Um, I, 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 uh, we have one that asks, um, I wonder if this work has prompted you to consider how the medicine or healthcare establishment might learn from um, the persuasive marketing of certain behaviors and products, how um, we might learn from this to make effective use of such marketing and community influences to promote more healthful life behaviors and habits. Well, it's um, it is it has been true that in the age of behavioral psychology, um, there's been a lot of attention to exactly the kinds of influencing um, strategies uh, for the sake of let's say uh, 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 dealing with bullying in school or you know shaping other healthful interventions. The what what the, the what I'll say in response to this is that um, the amount of resources <laughs> that went into sustaining this practice is just mind boggling. So, you know, as somebody who studied kind of the history of improved health over the 20th century, it has been truly eye opening and shocking to see the amount of resources devoted to this style of influencing uh, and marketing in communities. So while I think that these strategies are admirable if applied to health promoting practices, I also think that um, the capacity of those who are selling um, products like this um, and in trying to create markets in the name of health actually um, is, is a formidable force. And we only need to think about things like how OxyContin has achieved a widespread market through forms of influence uh, and you know, uh, ad, ad, um, advice from consulting firms like McKinsey who recently you know, settled a $600 million settlement for its uh, strategies of how you turbocharge the OxyContin market. And when you think about the role of physicians and others in, in helping that marketing 
um, helping those markets to thrive. The same strategies I'm describing that made the menthol market what it is are what other companies within uh, like Purdue Pharma and others were practicing as well. So I think it's important that we understand those strategies and those practices. Uh, it, but I agree that it might be great at some point to be able to turn those marketing and community influencers towards promotion of more healthful behaviors and habits. Yeah, I mean, this brings up the point that, you know, you, you made it in your presentation, but that these um, social scientific researchers were, were engaging in black studies and gender studies before those disciplines were formed. And the, you know, the amass of information um, they accumulated about kind of poverty and drug use and urban decline and the effects on, on people living in those environments, if they could have been put to positive healthful use, um, but instead they were, they were put to harmful use. Uh, and that's quite striking in what you've, mm -hmm. what you've shared. Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, researching this book gave me a, a great deal of whiplash in the sense that if you, if you extracted the fact that they were studying how you create tobacco markets and you try to understand the intimate way in which they understood, let's say, drug use, um, who used drugs, what their motivations were, what the social psychological drivers of drug use were, uh, they studied alienation, uh, they studied poverty, uh, and they studied, you know, African American and also white working class social structure. But it was always with an eye towards how you could leverage problems to create markets. And so, for instance, in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, companies began to understand that menthol smoking was rising among drug using populations in cities. And rather than kind of bemoaning drug use, they said, how can we associate more with those drug using communities? Uh, and one, uh, one strategy suggested by one social science firm was to come up with a new brand called Halfway, because if people thought about menthols as kind of drug-like, then why not just call it that create a new brand around it and sell it to people who are using it in conjunction with marijuana or maybe in conjunction with other drugs like heroin. So it's this kind of, you know, when I said it gave me whiplash, on the one hand, you're understanding something about community in, in its intimate way. On the other hand, um, like, like, like the 1985 study on the kind of Cools Inner City Project, where they're trying to understand, you know, the hopes, dreams, and frustrations of Black youth. And then they say, but, you know, what menthol, what, what cool is, it's a kind of a, it's a, it's an alternate for people who can't escape the ghetto. We need to provide for them a kind of a psychic means of escaping the ghetto. That's the thing that kind of makes your jaw drop. Yeah. Um, we have another, uh, other questions. Um, uh, what should we make of the Reverend Al Sharpton's claim that a ban on menthol cigarettes will lead to an increase in the market for illegal um, looses, um, resulting in greater police intervention into these markets and the Black community? Is there any validity in these concerns? Yeah, so I mean, what, what, first of all, what I would make of it is to understand um, Al Sharpton as part of a long history of exactly the kinds of figures that I've described in the book, the Benjamin Hooks who take money from the industry in order to defend its right to advertise on billboards in black communities, making the argument as Benjamin Hooks did that the argument against black themed advertising is racist because it makes the implicit argument that black people can't make decisions for themselves. There's a long history of what you might say is sort of black, black self-determination rhetoric in the black um, newspaper publishers who are dependent on tobacco advertising, who come aggressively out against public health advocates. And so Al Sharpton is part of that. He accepts money from the industry in order to support these arguments. Now, that is not to say that there's not a concern that's a legitimate one, which is the idea that when one makes a product illegal, 
Um, or when one polices a product aggressively, as they did with Eric Garner on the streets of, um, of Staten Island uh, for selling Lucy's, that this puts uh, people who like Eric Garner at disproportionate risk, right? But, but it's an argument that is itself disproportionate because most of the bans relate to, you know, sales from establishments and not individual sales. In fact, I think a lot of the regulatory um, moves that are being made are trying very carefully to sort of bracket off these kinds of aggressive policing practices. But I think it's a legitimate argument in some ways, even if it's being used to serve the interests of, of the industry. Um, I also think though that, um, you know, when you look at the history, what you see is there's a, there's a long history, for instance, in the 1980s, when cities like New York and others were banning indoor smoking at establishments. Uh, sadly, it was also the NAACP, which used a kind of a, this is racist argument to try to stand in the way of bans on indoor smoking. It's, it's shocking. And what they argued was that, um, you know, uh, executives at companies could smoke indoors because they have, they have, you know, one person offices, but it's people who kind of, you know, work in places where they can't smoke secretly indoors that will be forced outside, that it would be discriminatory in terms of its enforcement and effect. It's the same argument that's being made today. That is to say, to say that there, there's a discriminatory outcome that I want you to be afraid of. And that's what should keep menthols legal. I, I think fortunately, um, the NAACP no longer accepts or makes that argument. They refute it explicitly, but there are always going to be holdouts who um, are really kind of doing the bidding of the industry in order to maintain um, a market. It's been a successful strategy for years. And my sense is that it's about to kind of fail perhaps um, in this particular setting. Thank you, Keith. Justin, um, do you wanna wrap things up? Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Wei Lu, and thank you, Professor Tobel, as well for this um, incredible conversation and for this great book. Uh, if you haven't read it already, certainly recommend that you uh, get a copy of the book uh, and, and read it. Thank you for your time. Um, please join us next Wednesday as we host uh, Dr. Suzanne Coven for our first hybrid in-person and Zoom event of this semester for the Medical Center Hour. Dr. Coven is the writer in residence at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, uh, whose newest book, Letter to a Young Female Physician, has received wide acclaim for, as one reviewer put it, a rare combination of acuity and generosity. We're delighted to co-sponsor this event next Wednesday with the Virginia Festival of the Book, a highlight of their calendar of events next week. For our local participants, we encourage you to attend in person if possible on uh, March 16th uh, at noon at the Penn Hall Auditorium in the School of Medicine. Zoom connectivity will be also available for those who need to join remotely. So thank you again to everyone and we'll see you next week. Thank you.